for the cherisher of the universe and may peace and blessings of God be upon the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we go back again to our Sunday series. Uh, we've been doing this every single Sunday for a few weeks now, immediately after Salat al -As. And we go uh, through the stories of the Prophets of the Quran. It's a journey with the Prophets of God, peace and blessing of Allah be upon them. And for those who have been coming here right from day one, in the last few weeks, uh, you can uh, have a little 60 second rest because what I'm about to rattle, you've heard it before. But I have to say it every single time I start, I'm afraid. Uh, this has to be said every single time I start. That number one, I'm not a scholar of Islam. I have no uh, qualifications in the tafsir or the commentary of the Quran. I, I don't have such qualifications. I am of Arab origins, uh, but I'm not a scholar of the Arabic language of the Quran. And if you ask me a question on fuqh, jurisprudence, I exactly, my dear brother, it's exactly so what's there. I will run out of those double doors very, very quickly. You will see me flying out of the double doors because I have no, no experience or knowledge whatsoever in Quranic or uh, jurisprudence or the Sharia. This has its own people, it has its own um, experts at it. I'm a surgeon by trade, that's what I do for a living. I'm a doctor and I'm a surgeon by trade. Well, what is it that we're then doing? If we're, this is not a scholarly class and it's not a lecture, then what are we doing here? It's a journey, brothers and sisters. It's a journey. The stories of the prophets in the Quran, peace be upon them, are not stories for bedtime. There are stories for everybody. Anybody can look into the Quran, look at the stories that are there, and gain one or two things that can be applied directly into our lives. And so we should contemplate tadabbul, contemplate the stories in the Quran. Now, every human being, you don't have to be a scholar of Islam to contemplate these stories. To do the double to these stories, because that's, uh, by the way, that's what Allah asks all man, all mankind, to do the double over the Quran, provided your contemplation does not go outside the realm of scholarly knowledge, then we're fine, provided we don't end up in our contemplation into something that the scholars have taught us. Uh, you shouldn't know that, that's not what it means. Okay, so if it, if, if, if it takes us to that, then we've made a mistake somewhere. But so long as we are within the levels of scholarly, uh, uh, of, the, of the scholars of Islam, then we're fine. We can do our tabubah and learn directly from the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will make mistakes, brothers and sisters. Uh, people far greater than I am, those who are great theologians and great scholars of the religion, have made mistakes. It is not little me who wouldn't make a mistake. So if I make a mistake, by all means do correct me either immediately or after, after the talk. And so far, brothers, we've started with the Prophet Adam. The last few talks, see this, it's been about the Prophet Adam, peace be upon him. And there's one thing that we've learned just as a summary from the Prophet Adam, peace be upon him. Number one, we talked about the five steps of Adam. That before Adam, alayhi salam, before Adam, peace be upon him, was sent to the planet, you need this one as well. All right, well, no problem at all, is it better now? Okay. Um, before Adam, peace be upon him, was sent to the planet, five steps had to be taken. Step one is that Adam was created a Muslim. But that was not enough to make him God's vice-gerent on earth. The proof of that is that when Adam was created, Allah did not send him to the planet straight away. Despite the fact that before his creation, Allah said to the angels, I am going to create a vice-gerent on the planet. Somebody was going to take care of the planet. Now the angels are Muslims. And they asked Allah, are you going to send someone who is going to cause mischief on the earth and cause corruption on the earth and, and, and shed blood on the earth whilst we are here? And Allah says to them, I know what you don't know. So being a Muslim is not enough to take care of the planet, to be God's vicegerent on this earth. 
It's not enough brothers. Step two of Adam is that before he took the planet, Allah says he taught him the nature of all things, so he gave him knowledge. <laughs> Step two was knowledge. He had to have the knowledge of how to run the planet. But even after Allah gave him the knowledge, he didn't send him straight away. He put him in the garden. And that garden is very similar to the planet. It has halal and it has haram. Most of it is halal. There's only one thing haram in that garden. The others were, everything else was halal. Just like in the planet here. Most things on earth are halal. And the haram on earth is much smaller than the halal. And then, so step three, he has to be given experience. He has to have some experience on what he's about to get before getting to the real thing. Uh, we, we use several uh, examples to illustrate this. Uh, a pilot who uh, announces on the, before the takeoff of the plane that he's passed all his exams and his first class has got all the exams right, but has never flown a plane before and this is his first one. Now all of us will jump off the plane. But hopefully, we will all jump off the plane. We'll run away because he's going to crash the plane. It's not enough to have the knowledge. Now, thankfully, don't worry about it. Thankfully, no pilot these days uh, will be allowed to fly a plane without certain numbers of hours of experience, not just the, the knowledge. They have to have experience. And they, you know, they start from first officer before commanding a, a plane. Same with the doctor. You're not going to ask a surgeon who's never held a knife in his hands to operate on you even if he's passed his exams. And again, thankfully, that doesn't happen. I can tell you that. It doesn't happen. We don't hold knives without, without having experience and being trained to do it. And so here again, step three is he must have experience on running the planet before giving the real thing, before giving him the main thing to do. And step four is he had to make mistakes. We are mankind. We must make mistakes. That's the way we're created. And so here, Adam, when he makes a mistake, because he is knowledgeable and experienced, he recognized that a mistake had happened. You can only recognize your mistakes, brothers and sisters, if you have knowledge and you have experience. That's how you know you made a mistake. That's how you know things are not going on right. Before it becomes too late. And the fifth, fifth step was, he needed to learn how to correct his mistake. There's a process of when you make a mistake, how to correct it. There's a process for that. He had to be taught that. And when Adam then, peace be upon him, and his wife, corrected their mistakes, Allah gave them the plan. Now he was ready to go down. So these five steps, brothers, are the major infrastructural steps that we must have before we undertake any job in our life. Any job, any project, ask ourselves, do we have the knowledge, do we have the experience? If we make mistakes, will we be able to recognize our mistakes? And do we have a process for recognizing our mistakes? If we follow these five steps in every single thing we do in our life, then inshallah, inshallah, we will live a very, very fruitful life and we will then qualify as God's vice on earth. Like being a Muslim is not enough. Being Muslim is number one. I'm talking about being a vice I'm not talking about going to paradise. We're talking about the planet. That is, and we were created to be God's vice on the planet. We are here for a job. That job is part of our worship. We must go through those five steps. And last week, you can notice, the second series, we talked about the difference between Adam and Shaitan on why one was sent down to the planet with curses of Allah on him, and that's Iblis, and the other was sent down to the planet with the blessings of Allah and his wife. We said that both were given a command. Adam was commanded don't eat of the fruit, Iblis was commanded bow down before Adam. Second step, both disobeyed. Third step, both were questioned. Allah asked Adam, did I not tell you not to eat of the, two, the fruit? And Iblis was questioned, why did you not bow down before what I created? It was at step four that both of them differed massively, diametrically opposite to each other. Whilst Adam and his wife, in their response to Allah's question was, 
the law of numbers. We have transgressed against our souls. And if you do not forgive us, we'll be amongst the Muslims. No justifications, no excuses, taking the responsibility fully of what has happened and begging for forgiveness. Whilst the other, at least, said, I am better than him. I am better than him. You created him from mud, and you created me from fire. I'm greater than him, why should I? No, no. So one argued, one was arrogant, whilst the other was begging for forgiveness, repentant, and humble before Allah. One comes down to the planet, because Allah sent all of them down. Adam, his wife, and Iblis were all sent down to the planet. All of them. With enmity between them. Iblis is the enemy of man. Right from day one, that's going to how it's going to happen. Allah. But one said, on one group, which was Adam and his wife, they come down with the blessings of Allah. And the other comes down with the curses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and we move to the next step. Brothers, we've said last week that we have to differentiate between pride, that is arrogance, kibriya, and dignity, karam. And what happened between Adam and Iblis is a classic description of the difference between kibriya and dignity. Now, when Adam disobeyed Allah, when he and his wife disobeyed Allah, the first thing they lost were, they started to feel that they were naked. They were exposed. Their dignity was exposed. Dignity is no human, no jinn can take your dignity away from you. Dignity is something that Allah gave to you as a gift. Only you can surrender it. It has nothing to do with any external factor. It's got to do with you. Arrogance and pride, however, you don't have control of that. People become proud and arrogant because of their position, because of their wealth, because of their lineage, who their parents are, who their children are, who their tribe is, what color of passport they have, all these things can contribute to people becoming proud and arrogant. Now, none of that has anything to do with you. The position you occupy is external to yourself. One day you could lose it. The wealth that you have is external. It can be taken away from you, you can lose it. All that can be taken away from you. And it is people feeding into your, your kibriya. Your arrogance is something that people feed into you. Things external to you. Oh, look at how great it is. So your head starts getting bigger and bigger. And the day someone challenges you, you start saying, how dare you challenge me? Or how dare she challenges me? And you get angry and you re re respond in a very aggressive manner, how dare they, how dare they, and you get angry about it and you're heartbreak, that's arrogance. That's your ego has been hit. Dignity, on the other hand, has nothing to do with that. Dignity is something you have full control over. Your dignity has got to do with whether you obey the laws of Allah or not. By the way, brothers and sisters, if a non-Muslim, if a non-Muslim obeys the laws of Allah, even if he doesn't believe in doing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he obeys the laws of Allah on this earth, he has more dignity. I didn't say he has full dignity. I didn't say he has full dignity. But he has more dignity than the person who disobeys Allah day in day out. You follow the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for you, you will always have dignity. Hence, brothers and sisters, the first name of Allah that was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the cave, the first revelation was Iqra. 
warabbukal akram ikra warabbukal akram read and your word is the most the most dignified so if you follow Allah if you follow the rules of Allah if you follow the systems of Allah if you worship Allah you're worshiping the most dignified so of course you're going to be dignified of course your dignity is going to rise whilst if you stay away from Allah the more you keep away from Allah and his systems and his policies that he has laid down for man the more you keep away from them the less dignified you are you start to lose your dignity now when you lose your dignity what happens brothers and sisters a vacuum is created and humans don't like vacuums we're not created to accept vacuums so what comes in ego pride and arrogance so we said last week that if you, as your ego and pride goes up your dignity goes down and as your dignity goes up your ego and pride must go down and if you achieve full dignity you will lose all ego and arrogance now that's not easy you have to train yourself for it i'm still training myself for it we have to be trained for this that's why i look at my younger co my younger brothers and sisters and say start from now training yourselves for this but it has no age when it comes to doing what is right age is nothing more than a number allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this universal that's why we say the stories of the prophets in the quran are universal has nothing to do with time has nothing to do with place has nothing to do with age but you must train yourself that's why brothers you find sometimes in families when the father gets or the mother gets angry at the child when they disobey their their parents we have to ask ourselves as parents why are we angry are we angry because our pride and eager has been popped by our child or are we angry because our child is hurting themselves because that type of anger is fine if you are angry because your child is hurting themselves by doing the wrong thing that's fine but is that the reason because sometimes you hear parents tell their adult children get out of here i don't want to see your face again i disown you i do i do it whoa, whoa 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 that's your ego sorry brothers and sisters that's your ego you you can't disown your children they're your children whether you like it or not no matter what happens they are your children whether you like it or not when we get angry at our spouses a wife gets angry at her husband and her husband gets angry at the wife what's the reason is it something for the sake of Allah or is it because we feel that our ego and our pride have been hurt and all popped these are questions we must ask ourselves when we see our our blood beginning to boil because one of the first signs of arrogance and ego is the blood starting to boil and they, and when you start to say to yourself how dare they you just know that's ego beginning to set up that's so let me give you a simple simulation if my brother comes over here and starts to shout at me and i start looking at him how dare you talk to me like this can't you see the difference in age between us how dare you that's ego that's ego i have just lost my dignity but when i look at him calmly and i say my dear brother why are you talking to me like this is this is inappropriate this is very calm my blood pressure is not up my pulse hasn't gone up and i'm saying to him it's still appropriate but i need to listen to you why are you talking to me like this and if he doesn't give me a good reason i have every right to say well stop there i don't want to listen to you anymore goodbye that's it you see how calm it is can you see the two differences the difference between the two reactions one was anger how dare he how 
how can you talk to me like that? That's ego. The other was calm. But at the same time putting an, a stop to what's going on. That's dignity. That's dignity. That's why sometimes people go back to from work and they're so angry at what happened to them. They felt they were humiliated at work. Somebody humiliated them at work. And they spend the night in anger, turning over and kicking at the poor pillar. I call it the poor pillar. You know those pillows we keep hitting during the night? I do that. I'm, I'm human too. We, the, the poor pillow, it's not the pillow's fault. Well, the pillow doesn't even know what has happened. The pillow is a non-living thing. And the pillow, if it could talk, it would say, Oi! who did it, why are you fighting with me? Okay? And make me why the person who caused your problem is sleeping very well, by the way. You're the one who's eating yourself up. That's ego. That's pride. Now, let's talk about humiliation. Brothers and sisters, humiliation is the process that is used to try to take your dignity away from you. That's the process that is used to try to take your dignity away from you. So if you surrender your dignity, then the process of humiliation has worked. If you surrender your dignity, the process of humiliation has worked. Whoever tried it has been successful. But if you didn't surrender your dignity, has the humiliation worked or not? Has the process worked or not? It hasn't. So we say that was an attempt at humiliation. So people will attempt to humiliate you. Why do you want to agree? Why do you want to fall and surrender your dignity? Don't do it. And the Quran warns us about using the story of Adam. When he says, to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O children of Adam, do not let shaitan take away your dignity as he did with your forefathers. Because when, when, when shaitan kept telling Adam, go and eat of the tree, go and do this whispering, all that, what's he trying to do? He's trying to humiliate Adam, isn't it? When Adam then took of the tree, Shaitan succeeded at that moment, isn't it? Shaitan succeeded. That's why Adam lost his dignity immediately. But what does Adam teach us? May, may, the, may, may Allah's peace and blessings be on our father Adam. He's, he's a great teacher. He's a great, great teacher. May Allah reward him on our behalf for teaching us these things. What Adam taught us, peace be upon him, is if you make the mistake and surrendered your dignity, it's not over, you can what? You can take it back. You can take it back. How do you take it back? By repenting, saying I'm sorry, no answer, no, no, no answer. What that happens? Allah restores your dignity back to you. Gives it back to you. But He gives it back to you with a reward. Because remember we said last time, that what starts as a sin, if you follow the process that Adam put for us as commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it ends as a reward. So you, you, you commit a sin, then you beg for forgiveness. Then Allah forgives you and covers it up. Then He strengthens you. And we said that when you ask Allah for forgiveness, it means you've entered in His presence. You can't enter the presence of Allah and get out without a reward. It's impossible, brothers and sisters. It is impossible. That's the deal. You walk into the presence of Allah, you can't get out without a reward. So when we ask Allah for forgiveness for the sin that we committed, we get forgiven. It's all done. Khalas, as the Arabs would say, khalas, done, over. You get strengthened. And then he rewards you. That's what makes Satan mental. After all the efforts, 
that he has put to make us sin, we end up with a war. It's a beautiful thing for us. So let's not forget that even if we lose our dignity in the process of going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands, we can still get that dignity back. But for that dignity to come back, what must happen to ego and pride? You have to remove ego and pride. You must dispose of ego and pride and then dignity comes back in. Because dignity and ego can't go together. It's impossible. They can't, they can't live in the, same, in the same human body. So if you lose dignity, ego comes in. You want your dignity back? Get rid of ego, dignity comes back. Hence we say even at work, brothers and sisters, or even at home, if you are wrong, what should you do? What's the first thing that you're advised to do when you're wrong? Huh? How? What's the first thing? You admit you are wrong. You admit you are wrong. So if you made a mistake at work, what's the first thing you should do? You must, you must say at work, I was wrong. You must be honest enough to say, yes, I was wrong. There is no pride in there. And what happens when you say you are wrong at work? Okay. You repair your mistake, because you have to repair what has happened, and your dignity is restored completely. But suppose you insist, or you try to cover up. You try to cover up because you are arrogant. You cannot be seen to be wrong. You cannot be seen to be wrong. You are the head of your unit, or you are in charge. And therefore, hmm, if I admit that I am wrong, my enemies at work would use this against me. My enemies would use it against me and say he's not fit to be in charge. So I'm going to do what? I'm going to cover it up. What happens when you start covering things up? You will lie. Everybody will know you're lying, by the way. You cover it more and more and more till you go further and further down that dark tunnel of ego. And suddenly it all disappears. It all just disappears. Whilst if right from the beginning you said, Oi, alright guys, I know I'm in charge. I made a mistake. Sorry about this. I've learned. I won't make it again. Sorry to those who might have How do I make it up for you? And it's difficult because you're afraid that your enemies may come after you and say, huh? And they'll make fun of you. I want to see one person who made fun of the Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, when he admitted his mistake. Today, look at how many thousands of years we are in Liverpool, in the United Kingdom, in the 21st century, and we say, our Lord Adam, may peace and blessings of God. Mistake reduce his dignity when he corrected it? No. Brothers, there's a surah in the Quran. Hmm? Surah number 80. The first 16 verses, 16 verses of that surah, are talking about a mistake that one of the prophets committed and this was revealed at a time when that particular prophet was in a very weak and vulnerable position surrounded by his enemies one would have thought that if that prophet made a mistake in such a vulnerable weak position surrounded by his enemies we should like hush it up in case his enemies Use it against me. On the contrary, Allah immediately sent down 16 verses to talk about the mistake. Abasa, Watawalla. Watawalla. Abasa, Watawalla. That's a Meccan surah, isn't it? This was a time in Mecca when the Prophet ﷺ was not head of state. He didn't have an army. He was surrounded by his enemies who wanted to kill him. He made a mistake with the blind man. Allah immediately declared that mistake. Does any of us ever think lowly of our Prophet because of that mistake? How shall we do that? God forbid that we do that. Yet we actually praise our Prophet Muhammad for the way he accepted his mistake and the way he corrected his mistake exactly like Adam. 
he, had, he admitted his mistake and corrected it straight away. What did that do? It elevated the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In fact, today many of our scholars, brothers and sisters, use those verses of Abbas wa Tawalla to show that he did not make up the Quran and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not a liar. Because if he was a liar, what would liars do? They'll cover it up, exactly, brother. They will cover it up. But he didn't cover it up. It was exposed, you know, immediately for generations until the day of judgment. That raises the status of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he's a teacher. Now, some of us will make mistakes and we go and pray to Allah for forgiveness and we don't say it out, isn't it? Yeah, that's ordinary people that came in because we're not leaders. But leaders like the prophets, peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, Teachers like the prophets, peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, their mistakes are revealed to us so that we may learn how to correct those mistakes like them. That's why they have that elevated status above all men. My mistakes are not being exposed to everybody. I don't want my mistakes to be exposed to everybody. I, I might keep my, when I ask Allah for forgiveness, I have to keep my mistakes to myself. I don't have to expose myself. In fact, the Prophet said, if you made a mistake and nobody saw you, you know nobody saw you, just keep it to yourself, don't hang around. Just pray between you and Allah. That's for, you know, the ordinary people like, like me. But for great men like the Prophets, their mistakes are shown to us that we may learn how to correct those mistakes. And that elevates their status. That is why, brothers, there's a beautiful verse in the Quran that begins like this. That Allah has elevated Adam. Allah has elevated Adam. After all this, of course, the Prophet Adam has to be elevated. So, brothers, what we are learning from the Prophet Adam were so many steps, processes are being put in place. This is the first man to run the planet. This is the first man that is teaching us how to run our lives. And we can see how many things that we can apply in our everyday life from this great prophet of Allah. Now brothers, today we're going to get another major lesson from the prophet Adam. The story of the prophet Adam. If you had to use one word to describe envy, jealousy, right? Envy or jealousy? Sin. Jealousy. You see where jealousy got in least? Jealousy has a twin brother or sister. It has a twin. It's called arrogance. Arrogant people are jealous people. Because they look at others who might be on a high level, why? I want to be the one, I want to be there as well. But the arrogance and jealousy are not the same, they're just twins. They're just the same, one leads to the other. But let's talk about jealousy. Jealousy started right from time. It's a disease that infects a lot of human beings. There are several steps. I'm going to show you just one way of classifying jealousy. I'm not saying this is the way. I'm not saying this is the way. I'm just showing you one of the ways that may help us to know how this process works. I go in steps. I like doing things in steps. You must have noticed that by now. And yet last time I made a joke about this that probably because I'm a surgeon, I work in steps, okay? Everything has to be in steps. If you don't do steps in surgery, things are going to go very badly. So you must forgive me that I do everything in steps because that just comes with the, with the job. Let me get it here because we can't see it there. Uh, the problem is that if you get it there, the women can't see it. Uh, That's what I was told. Oh, it's the camera. And it's one Oh, the camera on. Yeah, camera. We go upstairs then. <laughs> Don't put me into trouble. 
I'm a well-trained husband. I know exactly where I, where I belong in life. I know my place, okay? Right. Okay. There are... Let's look at this particular classification. Steps of jealousy. And we'll see that there are five steps. Step one. Why him or her? As Adam was being created, Iblis asked, this, this must have asked the same questions as they, as the angels. Why him? But unlike the angels, the angels didn't ask that question from a jealous perspective. The angels ask that question from the point of they want to have knowledge. Why is the places? Why him? Then, step two. I am better than him. Step three, it should be me, because that's the crooked logic. If I am better than him, then it should be me. Two people are going for promotion. I am better than him, so I must get the promotion. End of story. That's the logic. Step four. Planning against him or her. Step five. Execute the plan. Let's go. Let's go through these steps. It least said, why should this person do me? I am better than him. Therefore, I am the one who should be in charge. I'm not going to prostrate before him. Why should I prostrate before him? I am greater than him. He should be the one to prostrate before me. So by the time you get to this step three, it should be me. And if you don't get what you want, what's going to happen? You start planning against that person. So Iblis starts to plan against Adam. In fact, Iblis told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah at step three, when Shaitan said, it should have been me, I'm greater than him. And Allah cursed him. What did Iblis say? My Lord. He even called him Rabbi. He even called him Rabbi, my Lord, give me time till the day of judgment. And I will do what? I will be on their right and on their left and in front of them and behind them and under them. He didn't say above them. The only place he didn't talk about was above us. Because Iblis will never be above us. End of story, he can never be above us. He said, I'll be by their right and by their left and in front of them. And what will I do? I will make them ungrateful to you. Because you elevated them higher, you elevated this creature greater than me, okay? I will make them ungrateful to you. What's he doing? He's in step four. He's what? Planning. And he's told us the plan. The plan is up, it's, 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 it's public. We know the plan. That Iblis is going to be in front of us and behind us and on our right and on our left and everywhere. To do what? To make us disobey Allah and not ask for repentance. Remember, that was, the, that was the trick. It's not just to make us disobey Allah. It is to make us disobey Allah and not ask for forgiveness. Because if we ask for forgiveness, we're going to get it. Which means all his hard work is gone. So his point is, he must make us not ask for forgiveness. And we have a session that a few weeks ago on 
the process about how he does that and what is the antidote to that. Anyway, so he has a plan. Then he executes the plan against the person, against the object of his jealousy. So he starts to whisper to Adam alayhi salam. He starts to whisper to him and tell him, this is, go and do this, go and do this, whisper, whisper. All lies. Now, by the time you get to stage five, what happens? At stage five, the object of the jealousy, the person who has been the object of the jealousy, may actually get harmed. May actually get harmed. But who is the biggest loser? Because when Adam was harmed by the jealousy of Ibiz, because Adam fell, isn't it? But it was temporary, isn't it? Adam, in his knowledge and experience and faith, was able to reverse the harm. So when he became naked and he asked God for forgiveness, Allah restored his dignity. But for that period, when Adam lost his dignity, he was harmed. But what had happened, he's able to treat the harm, get out of it. But who got cursed forever? Iblis. Who lost more in this jealousy game? Adam or Iblis? Iblis. Jealousy leads to the destruction of he who is jealous. It may harm the object of jealousy for a temporary period. It may. But the person who is losing the most is the jealous person. We're going to see these steps recurrent. Abu Jah, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Jah was the god, do you know his nickname before Abu Jah? Abu Jah is what the Muslims called him. Do you know what he used to be called? Abu Hakam. Abu Hakam. For he was Abu Jah, the father of ignorance. Prior to Islam, they used to call him Abu Hakam, the father of wisdom. How many of us call him Abu Hakam? In fact, in one of the, uh, I once watched a play, uh, a play that was done, um, you know, to, to show what was happening in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and it showed that they made a little error in the play, where the person was acting as Abu Sufyan. And this is, you know, in the Meccan period when Abu Sufyan himself was not a Muslim. And Abu Sufyan is having a discussion with Abu Jahl. He says, yeah, Abu Jahl. <laughs> and Abu Sufyan never called Abu Jahl Abu Jahl during that period. You know, he doesn't really call him because Abu Jahl is the nickname given him by the Muslims. But the name has stuck to Abu Jahl. It has just stuck. In fact, many people don't even know his real name. <coughs> His actual real name, because Abu Abul Hakam is his, 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 is still the nickname. His actual real name, many people have forgotten his real name. Omar, Omar. No, Amr. 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 Yes, Amr. Yes, yes, yes. Amr. Ahd al Omar. That was the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? And so Amr. How many people even remember his, 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 his real name? All we know about him is. Abu Jahl. Now what was the issue with Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl could not get into his mind. Why Muhammad? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why him? That shepherd, that poor shepherd, okay he married a rich woman at the end, but he still is that poor orphan shepherd who can't read and write. Abu Jahl, by the way, knew how to read and write. Who can't read and write. You know, what kind of... Who is this person? And then Abu Jahl says, I am better than... I'm better than him. So it should have been what? It should have been me. I should have been the prophet, not... Not him, because I am greater than him. But what then happens when Allah does not give the prophet to, to, to Abu Jahl? What does Abu Jahl start to do? He starts to plan against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And did he harm the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to a certain extent? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And then he executed that plan, isn't it? But who at the end lost more? Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lose anything at the end? Because everything that was taken from the Prophet 
was returned back to the Prophet at a much bigger and much higher state. What did Abu Jahl want? To be the ruler of Mecca. To be the man in charge of Quraysh. One tribe in the entire planet. Today, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 1400 years after his death, 1.7 billion people on earth, every single day of their life, as they do their prayers, they say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad. 1400, um, until the day of judgment. Until the day of judgment. Every single part of the planet, from north to south, east and west, there is a masjid that five times a day says, the Mu'addin says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And Abu Jah, <laughs> singing. <laughs> and for 1400 years, he sinks lower and lower and lower and lower. As Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gets higher and higher and higher, and this one sinks lower and lower and lower. Pray for him, Lanatullah Ali. Who? Exactly. Lanatullah Ali, exactly. Subhanallah. We say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, wa Lanatullah Ali. Can't get worse than that. You see what happens when that jealousy gets to stage five? You can see what happens when it gets to stage five? It is destruction on you, the person who is jealous, not your object. You, will, you may harm your object for a temporary period of time, but you're the bigger loser. Shaitan did it, many people did it. And what then happens is Abu Jah did exactly what Iblis did. With jealousy comes a bit of what? It has a twin brother called arrogance. Now brothers, let us see. Let us transfer this to our everyday lives. Is there anybody here who has not been in step one and two? Who at one point in your life looked, why him? Should have been me. Why am I better? That's step one and two. If you have never felt jealous in your life, as in, you've never said these two questions, then please raise your hands up. And come and sit here, and I'll sit down there, and you teach me how you did it. Because we've, most of us have at least been in step one and step two, nothing against me. The thing, brothers, is this, the trick is this, is if you recognize, if you know, if you have the knowledge, remember what did Adam teach us? Knowledge and experience. If you have the knowledge, you will recognize when the jealousy starts to burn. And so you will hold yourself back because you know that was the end result. It's your destruction, not the object of your jealousy. By the way, brothers, as far as the process of this earth is concerned, it doesn't matter whether the process, the object of your jealousy is a Muslim or not. I, I want us to get this out of our brains, that it's okay if it is a non-Muslim. We're Muslims, so it's going to be fine. No, it's not. It is not. If you practice jealousy, you, a Muslim, practices jealousy against a non-Muslim, you will harm him temporarily and you will be the biggest loser. Has nothing to do with the faith of the object. It has got to do with the concept of jealousy. A lot of people make that mistake. They say, oh, non-Muslim. No, 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 no. Allah is al-adl. What does al adl mean? The supreme injustice and fairness. Allah is fair. Allah is fair. He has put a system on the planet. Those who have the knowledge, those who have the experience, those who can recognize their mistakes and know how to correct them, they will go up. They'll go up. Whilst those who refuse to go through that system will go down, even if they are Muslims. One of the greatest scholars of Islam in, in, in the last 1400 years, uh, over 600 years ago, said, Allah will send victory to the non-Muslims who are fair. 
and will send defeat to the Muslims who are unfair. Allah will send victory to the non-Muslims who are fair. And will send defeat to the Muslims who are unfair. Has nothing to do with that. It's got to, there are systems on the planet, brothers and sisters, we must understand this. There is a physics in the way the planet is being run. Who created that physics? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In science, we call it the physics of life, the physics of the planet. The theological term, the religious term is Sunan illahi al That is the sunnah of Allah on this earth. The sunnah of Allah on this earth has nothing to do with whether you are a mu'min or a non-Muslim. has nothing to do with that. It's a sunnah. If you're fair, you're going to get there. Why did the Prophet ﷺ, when he sent, when he sent the first companions to the Hijrah, the first Hijrah, the first Hijrah wasn't, wasn't to Medina. It was to Abyssinia, modern day Ethiopia. Was the king then a Muslim at the time of the Hijrah? He wasn't. That he became a Muslim later, that's fine. But at the time that the Prophet sent, sent the Sahaba, this is the Sahaba al Kiram. One of them is Jafar ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib. One of them was his own daughter. These are great men and women. What did he send them to? He sent them to Ethiopia, Abyssinia, modern day Ethiopia. What did he say about the Najashi, the niggas of Abyssinia? The Najashi said he is just. No one is treated unfairly in his kingdom. To the extent that when Amr ibn al As, who at the time was not a Muslim, Amr ibn al As was a close friend to the Najashi, was a close friend to the Najashi, he went to take the, he wants those people back to torture them in, 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 uh, in Mecca. And try to tell the Najashi that we the Muslims, we the Muslims, insult Christ, peace be upon him. And when the Muslims under Jafar and Nibdal said, no, we don't believe Christ is a messenger. But yes, we don't believe he is the Son of God. Yes, we don't believe he is God. We don't believe in all that. But yes, we believe he is a messenger of God. And and Najashi came from that part of Christianity where what do you mean he is not the Son of God? What, what, what do you mean? But when he heard what Jafar ibn Abi Talib said, the Najashi, that Christian king, rose above the difference in faith. He rose against that difference in faith and said, why do you want to take them? Because they want to have a freedom of faith? Freedom of their religion? Have they harmed anybody in Mecca? Amr ibn al says no. Did they steal anything from anybody? Amr ibn al says no. Are these people free men and women? Amr ibn al says yes. So the only difference between you and them is a difference in faith? You want to force them to abandon their religion? To return back to yours? And at this time Amr ibn al couldn't speak. And Najashi said, no, I am not handing them over to you. Friendship or no friendship, I am not handing them over to you. That is what is, what is, that is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the planet. It has nothing to do with Christian or Muslim. It has nothing. But we as Muslims, who are supposed to be the people who are at the vanguard, the forefront of justice and fairness, what have we done to ourselves in the last few hundred years? We've gone backwards, haven't we? Yes, we are. Let's not hit ourselves. Badly, you know, we still believe in La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. But what we have lost, brothers, Jazakallah khair. But what we have lost, brothers and sisters, is the systems and the processes on earth. That's what we've lost. And the reason to go through this journey with the prophets is let's return to the original. Let's return back to square one. How did the prophets deal with this? And it starts from you, the person. You should not be jealous. So when you go to work, don't, when you, don't try to as much as possible 
not to be jealous of someone at work. And when you see the jealousy beginning to start, what should you do? You control it. You say, I will be there him in a short time, don't you? Back off, run. Run away. It, it just doesn't happen at work. It happens in everywhere. You know, sometimes you see a brother who's driving in with a lovely, nice, lovely car. And maybe he's not as good as you in other things. You know, maybe, maybe he's not as good as you other things. And inside of you, you start asking, well, why him? I'm better than him. Oh, he must have done something wrong to get the car. Because if it was fair, I should have the car. I should have the car. The fact that I don't have the car means he must be doing something wrong. What are you beginning to do? You're beginning to plan. Because one day you're going to meet a couple of friends and say, no, he must be doing something wrong. What are you doing? You're executing a plan. You're trying to undermine that person. You're trying to make sure that people hate him. It will backfire hopelessly badly on you. You may succeed in the beginning and people start wondering, oh, so how did he... Yeah, that's true. How did he get the car? And you're going to be happy. Huh? People, are, people are beginning to question. It is only a little bit of time. Just like when Adam, for that temporary period, was naked. What did Shaitan do? Shaitan started to dance. I've got him. What happened at the end? Adam was rescued and Shaitan got shocked. Now you get shocked too. Now, brothers, sometimes injustice happens in life, isn't it? Sometimes it should have been you. Sometimes it should have been you at work. And I get this all the time, brothers, where somebody comes and tells me, the only reason I wasn't given the particular job is because of the color of my skin. That happens a lot. The institutions in the United Kingdom and in the United States and across Europe and across most of the civilized world do recognize that racism happens, isn't it? And that sometimes people of ethnic minorities do not get the particular job that they are qualified for just because of racism. So what do you do for that? When you say, Oi! It should have been me. Are you step three jealousy? No, it depends on how you do it. Let's put it this way, brothers. Person number A comes from ethnic majority. Person number B comes from ethnic minority. Both apply for a job. It is clear that the person from ethnic minority is more qualified than the person from the majority. But the guy from the majority gets the job. The person from the ethnic minority, when they raise their concerns, they raise their concerns against what? Against the person who got the job? No. No. You're raising your problem with the system that allowed this to happen. May Allah bless the person who got the job. That's not what you're fighting for. Because the moment you turn your face towards the person, you're in jealousy. Because now you're going for, you're targeting an individual. But he is not the one who gave himself the job, was it? It's not his fault he's from an ethnic majority, is it? That's not his fault, he was created that way. So why are you fighting with the person who got the job? Even if he's lesser than you, your problem is with the system. That's a different matter. Uh, you better be right. Yeah, don't just throw the, I, 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 I really advise brothers and sisters, do not throw the racial card unless you're 100% sure of what you're doing. It's not every time you don't get a job, it must be racism. It doesn't work that way. Or Islamophobia. Or gender. Or age. You know, there's something called the Equalities Act here in Britain. It's called the Equalities Act of 2010 that lists, lists, have, lists characteristics that you should never be discriminated against. You should never be discriminated against because of your age or your gender or your religion or your 
or your ethnicity. Uh, there, there is, there's a list, a whole list of what you can't be discriminated against. Do not use that <coughs> unless you're 100% sure that this is the case and that you do have evidence backing you up. It cannot just be because of a perception. And I perceive they didn't take me because I am Muslim or I'm an ethnic minority. That's not enough. You must back your perception up either with logic or with, with evidence. Then you ask for a review. That's not the same as the five steps of jealousy because you're not targeting the person who took the job. What are you targeting? You're targeting the system. But when you start targeting the person, that's jealousy, I'm sorry. That's jealousy. And then you start planning against the person. Then you put the plan into action. Brothers, if you're in step one and step two, I tell you that in my life, I have fallen victim of step one and step two. And occasionally I've gone to step three. Alhamdulillah, that I was rescued several times before proceeding to step four. Because by the time you get to step four, between step four and step five is... You know, once you put your leg into step four, you are, you just heading towards step five, let's say. It's, it's, it's just downwards there. And you're going to really, 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 really suffer. You saw what happened to Iblis. Iblis's problem is he went into step five. We saw Abu Jah. We saw Pharaoh. You saw the, 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 the Nimrod, the king that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam argued with. We can list them all over the time. It's just not worth it. But you must have the knowledge to recognize when you fall upon these steps. And it happens on a daily basis. Why did he get married? Why did she get married? Oh, the only reason she got married is because, you know, her father is rich. If she wasn't, if her father wasn't rich, she wouldn't get married. Oh, the only reason he got the job is because his daddy is in charge. Whoa, 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 where did you get all that from? Okay, if you really think so, go for the system, don't go for the person. Don't undermine the individual. The moment you individualize it, the, more, the moment you personalize it, that's jealousy. Pull out of it. Snap out of it. And one good way of knowing is that once you step into these steps, remember that who's going to lose at the end? You will. As Satan did. Brothers, next week, inshallah, we're going to look at Adam. I, I know I said this last week, but I, I, I have to go through this first. That now we're going to proceed to Adam on earth. Because we're going to see a terrible incident that happened when Adam was on earth. The first incident of murder. And we're going to go and analyze that incident properly. Because if you look at what happened, it was these steps of jealousy. Why him? I'm better than him. He plans, goes against, executes the plan. And who lost at the end? The murderer. It's a horrible thing. So I'll stop here, brothers and sisters, and I'll take questions, comments, and of course, most importantly, corrections, if there are any.